Hello everybody, this is part of our series looking at the Tudors, uh, in particular AQA A-Level Unit 1C. And what we're doing is we're going through the different um, the different monarchs and we're looking at the key questions. So the key question we're looking at today is in what ways and how effectively was England governed during this period? The monarch we're looking at is Henry VII. Now this all overlaps and connects really, really closely with the previous video that I've done looking at um, the power of the monarchy and how Henry VII both consolidated and extended that. So we're going to look at the various aspects. Now, again, we'll start with the situation in 1485. Henry VII just won the, war, won the War of the Roses. He needs to strengthen the royal grip of power. He needs to create secure, stable government. Now, if he's going to be, if he's able to deliver that kind of stability, law and order, prosperity, uh, then then he's going to be able to secure his position in the long run and, and the, the position of his dynasty. Now, the actual bullet point in the spec is government, councils, parliament, justice, royal finances, domestic policies. Now, some of those, the, particularly the bits at the end, we covered it really extensively in the previous video. So I'll direct you to that at the end. But we're going to deal with all those different bits and a little bit more besides. Make sure you've got a really strong understanding of how Henry VII governed England. And to start to get you to think about, well, is that effective? And I'll be highlighting um, some of the strengths and some of the problems as we go through. Right. <clears throat> the major position where power lies in the monarchy under Henry VII is with Henry VII. Now, the group of people he works with most closely and therefore probably have the most influence of what's going on are his royal council, the king's council. Now, in theory, there are 227 councillors, but for most of those, this is just a, a, a title. It's a, a kind of an honorary position. Most of them didn't ever go and sit in a council meeting. Now, the council was made up of nobility, uh, men from the church. About 50 percent of the people actually on the council were were high, high ranking members of the church. And then there were other skilled members from the educated classes. And this is a really important part of Tudor history, actually, because one of the things you'll see when we get on to Henry VIII is Henry VIII also relies on these lower born men um, that take kind of really leading positions. For example, under Henry VIII, you see Wolsey and Cramner. Now, he, under Henry VII, there's less of this idea of a, a principal minister who's running everything for him. Henry VII does a lot of it himself, but he has a core group. Now, one of them is John Morton, who's Archbishop of Canterbury and becomes a, a, a cardinal in 1493. Uh, there's Richard Fox and there's Reginald B uh, Bray. Now, these are key figures. Uh, Bray is, is Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and, and had been with Henry from before Bosworth and had helped fund Henry's army for the Battle of Bosworth. Uh, and Bray also led the council learned in the law. All of these men had received legal training and were excellent administrators. So as you can see, Henry VII is relying on a group of men that he's picking on their merit rather than on their birth. Now, my favourite bit, my favourite bit of information about any of these is to do uh, with John Morton. Now, he came up with Morton's fork, and I just think this is absolute genius. Now, what he says is if a nobleman appears to be rich, he's really well dressed. He's, he's living an ostentatious lifestyle. He's, he's got um, jewellery and he, he's got um, a kind of really fancy house and all the rest of it. Then he's obviously really well off. He can afford to lend the king money. Now, you think, OK, well, I won't show, be showy with my wealth and I'll escape and I won't have to get loaning the king a load of money. Morton then says, right, but if the nobleman appears poor, he must be hoarding his money like a miser. He's, he's, he's refusing to spend it himself, in which case he's just got loads and loads of gold sat in, in locked boxes in, in his house. And it'd be much better if he just lent that to the king. So if you're a member of the nobility and you are showing off your wealth, you can afford to lend the king money. If you're a member of the nobility and you appear to not be very well off, you're a miser, you're hoarding it. You can afford to lend the king money. And you, therefore you can start to see why Henry VII liked Morton and it, why he was such an effective administrator. So there were members of the nobility that were on the council, uh, and these included um, Jasper Tudor, who became very powerful. Uh, he had a position in, in Ireland, but particularly in running Wales. Um, the, uh, there was the Earl of Oxford, 
um, and he was made Great Chamberlain. Uh, there was Thomas Howard, who was made Lord Treasurer. Uh, and then also working around the council, like some of the men we've mentioned before, we, we've got these kind of educated, um, professional skilled lawyers, advisors. Uh, Henry was looking to exploit Crown lands as much as he could, and he needed trained men in auditing and property law and with administrative skills to do that. Um, and we see this, and this is really important, important with the Tudors, that Henry VII starts this off, we should have little care actually of the social class of the men who were serving him, as long as they could do a good job. This is something that really would make Henry VII's government stand out at this point, because if we go back to kind of the medieval period, their position were given in government based on title and lineage and family name and blood, rather than on merit. And so Henry VII seems to be doing something very clever here. Right, one of the most famous groups uh, under um, Henry VII or this other council, the Council Learned in the Law. Um, so it was established in 1495. It was ruthless. It was a small body of train men and it went after anybody with money, in particular the nobility. It was highly efficient. It broke the law, probably, because it didn't really have any proper safeguards around it. So it's to do with uh, King's revenue. Uh, led by Bray until his death, and then uh, the two kind of key figures in it are Epson and Dudley. I really recommend you look into the Dudley family. They kind of they run through the Tudor reign and are really really interesting because we've got this Dudley here who's going to end up getting uh, executed under Henry VIII, having very loyally served and very effectively served Henry the Seventh. We're going to see a Dudley in the future who uh, is really significant in the reign of Edward, who becomes uh, the uh, Duke of Northumberland, and then we're going to see Robert Dudley, who is going to be uh, the closest thing to a partner, really, for Elizabeth I, but also Robert Dudley's older brother, Guilford Dudley, who was married to Lady Jane Grey, the Queen, for nine days. So the Dudley family are just brilliant, really, really interesting uh, bit of history. So Epson and Dudley are these two key figures in the Council of the Law. They go after people, but they are not only investigator, they are judge and jury as well. And so they twist things and bend things and make things fit uh, as best that they can. There is no right of appeal. So, and again, you've got to feel a bit sorry for them. They do a wonderful job for Henry the Seventh. He must have been very happy. They brought in loads of money, which is what he wanted. Henry the Eighth then executes them for breaking the law. Um, uh, and this is largely to win favour with the nobility and the people. And there was actual celebrations in the streets following uh, the execution of these two men. There are some other committees around as well. So, for example, the Committee for the Influence of Acts of Livery, uh, the Council of General Surveyors. And they, these, order, again, were auditing revenue from Crown lands and making sure the king was getting everything due to him. When it comes to financial uh, management, Henry VII is king, quite literally. Right. This is the bit that I often find students find a bit confusing about the Tudor world is the court. It is not a court as in a legal court. The court is this group of people who follow the king round. They are the great and the good, the important people. And they get to do things like um, socialise with the king. They go hunting with him. They bang, have banquets with him. Uh, they go out on progress with him, which is when the king goes out and visits different parts of the, the country. And so it is a kind of soft power, but that kind of soft power is really, really important in this period of history. Because if you were got on well with the king, then you might be able to influence him. You might then gain some of these key important positions in councils and, and, other, and elsewhere, and you'd have increased status. Um, so there's different levels of the court. There's the, the, the household proper, which um, uh, looked after the king and his guests, and that's supervised by the Lord uh, Stuart. Uh, and then we've got the Star Chamber, which is, again, more in inner sanctum. And then if you get beyond that, you're going to get into the, the real inner sanctum, which is the Privy Chamber. Um, and that's established after Stanley's uh, portrayal of Henry. Uh, so Stanley, who he, he thought was he, his kind of key ally, and he married him to his mother, which is a, an odd way of rewarding somebody. But he had, and then Stanley turns against him. And so Henry becomes rather paranoid. Um, and getting access to the king becomes more and more difficult, which is one of the reasons why we see Henry VII's reign as very much a personal one, because he seems to have trust issues. He doesn't seem to want to pass power to anybody else. Uh, and those who does give um, power and influence to tend to be these ruthless guys who go out because the way to win favour with Henry VII is to deliver him big 
bags of cash. Right, <clears throat> we have Parliament at this time. Do not get confused and think it's like Parliament today. Parliament in the time of Henry VII, it only sits uh, when he wants it to. It goes away when he wants it to go away. And essentially, we're looking at King and Parliament, and the Parliament does what the King wants it to do in, the most, in most cases. It doesn't really have very much authority. Now, we see the potential rise of, of Parliament under Henry VIII, which comes later. It only met seven times in the reign of uh, Henry VII, uh, five of which are in the first ten years of his reign. It passed various bits of legislation. It passed Acts of Attainder, 138 of those, 46 of which were reversed. 10% uh, of the statutes and things that it passed um, were, were to do with um, control um, of the provinces. Other acts were to do uh, with things like wages and hours and kind of other uh, kind of administrative things about how the country was run. So some of the important kind of staging posts of what happened with Parliament. Um, so 1485, 86, it conferred his kingship and, and passes those attainders on those who fought against him. Remember, saw this in previous videos, this is a bit of genius where he uh, gets them to backdate his reign to the day before Bosworth. So the people fighting him are traitors, even though they thought they were fighting for the rightful king. It's confusing, but it's great. Henry also gets um, all the revenue from, they call it tonnage and poundage, and essentially that's import and export uh, taxes. Um, and then you've got the Act of Resumption that returns all the crown land uh, that had been lost since 1455 to him. And then we've got the taxes of 15th and 10th, which are just other things to do with uh, revenue coming from um, various points into him. Now, 1487, we've had a bit of lawlessness and then we were doing a bit of financing after the Battle of Stoke. Um, but again, fairly straightforward stuff for a monarch and his parliament at this time. Uh, we, we do see various bits where essentially what parliaments in the Tudor world do is they give the king or queen money when they want it. Uh, we, we see this uh, with, with the Parliament of 1489-90, um, but when he does things like this, it causes him problems. You can see this in 1489-90 and 1497, where we saw the rebellions. Again, if you see the, uh, the Power of the Monarchy um, video on this, there's more on it, where the, when he's raising money to fight against um, the French, then uh, Yorkshire goes, well, that's nothing really to do with us. And we, we were having our own financial problems. You can't have any money from us. And when he's looking to deal with um, invasions from Scotland, the Cornish go, well, we're not really scared of the Scots all the way down here. We don't want to pay that. And again, we see a rebellion on that. Uh, the, this um, um, levies towards the end of his reign, 1504. Uh, and one of the bits in this, we can see a little bit of power, a little bit of, of kind of pushback from Parliament when he asks for this rather odd um, money to, for the posthumous knighthood of his dead son, uh, and he asks for 90 grand and he only gets 40. So maybe showing that he hasn't got absolute control, but we have to uh, remember that the, the English uh, monarch's power is not complete uh, authoritarian. He, they don't have absolute power. There are some restraints on it, and Parliament has a degree where it can kick back and say no. Right, one of the most difficult bits of controlling uh, his realm for Henry VII is controlling the, the regions. And he has set up these provisional councils, and he makes sure that he puts people on that he can trust. So we, we see um, the north controlled by Percy uh, uh, and then the Earl of Surrey, uh, Thomas Howard. But we do see a rebellion in Yorkshire, so that doesn't necessarily um, go uh, completely to plan. Wales is... Um, it is more straightforward for Henry. He um, he appoints uh, Jasper Tudor to look after it, um, his his uncle. Then Arthur is named Prince of Wales. It's the tradition going back to 1301 that the Wales is ruled by the king's eldest son. Um, now the, the often talk about Wales and the marches. The marches, oh, the march was the area, kind of the border area between Wales and England, and it's kind of recognised its own separate kind of um, area state type thing. Um, so. Members uh, from the march don't attend Parliament. The king's writ doesn't doesn't run there, but he is the monarch. It, it's so slightly different. Um, Ed, Edward the Fourth is head of a council there in 1471, and that's revived by Henry in 1493. Uh, and uh, Arthur, who was seven at the time, is named uh, uh, as its nominal head. Well, see, it seems odd at this point when we get on to uh, Edward uh, ruling Edward the Sixth ruling himself uh, as a nine-year-old. Then it seems slightly less odd. Ireland is a real problem. 
Um, so Jasper Tudor is Lord Lieutenant, but obviously he's he's in Wales dealing with Wales. So that's actually an honorary position. Um, the the key figure is is the Lord Deputy. Now the most important of these is Edward Poining, who became uh, became Lord uh, Deputy in 1494. Uh, he does uh, reorganise the courts. He brings in Poining's law that increases um, the authority of the crown. Now, when we talk about the authority of the crown in, in Ireland, we're, we're really talking about a, a very small area. It's an area known as the Pale, which is a, a, an area of land uh, around uh, Dublin and to the north of Dublin. So if you ever heard the very old saying, something is beyond the Pale, which means it's outside the bit of Ireland that the, um, the English crown controlled. So it's... <laughs> The, Henry the Seventh is king of Ireland, but it, it really pretty much is in name rather than in reality. He's king of Dublin and a bit of land around it. The rest of Ireland is ruled by Irish chieftains. Um, the most important are uh, the Geraldine and Butler families. Head of Geraldine families is, is the Earl of Kildare. The Earl of Kildare gets involved uh, with the Warbeck Rebellion and so loses his position as Lord Deputy. Um, he he then is reinstated when Henry realises quite how difficult Ireland is to control and quite how expensive it is to control Ireland without one of the great chieftains in place. So Ireland is a problem and we, we see it involved in some of the, the foreign plots against Henry uh, VII. Notably not on here is uh, Cornwall, uh, which is another area where Henry has some real problems. So there is a mixed bag of successes when it comes to controlling the provinces. There are clearly some problems in Ireland. There are clearly some problems in the north. There is problem. Uh, there are problems down in Cornwall, but there are also some areas of success, uh, notably uh, in Wales and the Marches. Right. So local government and justice then. So the, the majority of this is appointed done through JPs, justices of the peace. Uh, they're appointed county by county. They met four times a year to administrate uh, justice, but 18 per county. Now, this is a great thing if you're king. Justices of the peace is a, a, a position which is unpaid, but involves quite a lot of work, normally appointed for one year. Uh, and it was something that gave you great prestige. So you've got lots of people who want to do it and want to work really hard and do a good job for you as king, for which you don't have to pay them anything. Now, this is a really quite effective system. And what Henry VII does is he expands their powers. So he gives them the power to arrest poachers and hunters in 1485, gives them the power to grant bail in 1491, uh, and it gives them the, the power to choose juries, uh, juries in 1495. Uh, and they, they had the ability to decide on all criminal matters except for murder. Uh, and then mo the most difficult cases uh, were referred up to the Assize Court. So they, these JPs are a fundamental part of local government and the administration of justice uh, through Henry VII's reign. And they, they remain a really important part of government and law and order through the reign of the, all the Tudors. Um, you also had sheriffs and they would manage parliamentary election. And they were used for peacekeeping and detention of criminals. It's really important to note that at this point in time, there is no police force. Right. <clears throat> Royal finances and domestic policies. On this one, I'll guide you towards my previous video on Henry VII restoring, develop, restoring and developing the powers of the monarchy, where I go through all the stuff on all the money he seizes from all the nobility. And we look at the rebellions and we look at all the stuff he does with finances. Now, he's great with finances, often referred to as the miser king. There's some really good old sources where you've got old ledgers, financial ledgers, where Henry the Sun's actually gone down and initialed all the entries in it. He's really, really hands on with this, took a lot of personal responsibility for it. And, and th this kind of careful financial management is something that he doesn't pass on to his son, who does an incredible job of em emptying the royal coffers. Um, it is something that he is inherited by his granddaughter, Elizabeth I, who is another monarch who is notably very careful with her money. Now, his major areas of domestic uh, policies, again covered in that other video, are, are to do with controlling the nobility, suppressing uh, rebellion, and ensuring that, that control and stability across his realm. And we've seen some of that with the stuff with the uh, regional councils. And the rest of it really is to do with keeping hold of those uh, nobles and then making sure that the Yorkist threat does not rise up. Something that even things like his marriage are really good at, uh, at dealing with because his uh, wife has York Yorkist blood. 
therefore his kids have Yorkist blood. So more details on that, catch that other video. Right. Thank you very much for, for watching. Please don't forget to like, to comment, uh, to subscribe. Uh, it's been really good to talk to you all. I look forward to sp spending more time with you and going through the rest of these key questions through with Henry VII, onto Henry VIII, onto the mid Tudors, and then finally onto Elizabeth. There's a lot to get through. It's going to take quite a while to get there, but hopefully this will give you everything you need for this particular unit. Speak to you all again soon.